You're watching the Microsoft U.S. Health and Life Sciences Confessions of Health Geeks podcast, a show that offers industry insight from the health geeks and data freaks of the U.S. Health and Life Sciences industry team. For this episode of the Year of the Nurse and Midwife, Molly McCarthy interviews Dr. Ernest Grant, president of the American Nurses Association, the nation's largest nurses organization. Hey, it's so great to have you here today, Dr. Grant, um, president of the American Nurses Association as part of Microsoft's Year of the Nurse um, and Midwife celebration. And we're especially grateful to have you here during Nurses Week and Nurses Month and wanted just to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself today. Well, thank you very much, Molly. I uh, appreciate the invitation and uh, looking forward to our conversation that we're, we're going to have. Um, as far as uh, introducing myself or my background, uh, I started in nursing a long, long, long time ago. Uh, actually, um, I started out my nursing career in uh, as a LPN or a licensed practical nurse or in some right. parts of the country, licensed vocational nurse. And uh, but I originally wanted to uh, actually go to med school and become a uh, anesthesiologist. But being the youngest of seven kids and uh, with a single parent, my father died when when I was five. So um, even though I had the grades, um, you know, and could possibly get a few scholarships, I probably would not be able to get enough to, you know, to go through right. uh, basic four years of college and then med school after that. So my high school gu guidance counselor suggested, well, why not consider nursing? and uh, maybe you could become a nurse anesthetist and then if you still wanted to go to med school you could work your way through as a nurse anesthetist and um, and then he said well you might not like nursing so take this one year course and if so you can easily transition into uh, you know a, a, a two-year or four-year program so i did that and about six months into the um, lpn program I realized that nursing was my calling. So I forgot all about, uh, you know, going to med school. And, uh, but I did realize also that I wanted to be able to do more for my patient than the limited role that the LPN had at that time. So um, I knew I wanted to get my, uh, my RN degree. So I uh, no sooner graduated from the LPN course uh, and then started taking uh, courses towards completing my baccalaureate degree. And then once I completed the bachelor's, decided to put the master's and then always <laughs> had in mind about getting the doctorate as well. So uh, I right. wound up getting, getting them all. Great. That's great. What do you, so where are you practicing today or what, tell me a little bit about what you're doing today, you know, with ANA uh, well, and then in your, in your everyday life. Okay. Well, today I have the extreme pleasure of serving as the uh, president of the American Nurses Association. We uh, represent the uh, 4.3 million registered nurses in the United States. Um, and uh, But prior to that, the, the position here at ANA is a full-time position. So, um, But I spent uh, 36 and a half years uh, working as a uh, staff nurse and then eventually uh, nurse educator uh, at the University of North Carolina uh, hospitals in Chapel Hill, uh, where I headed up the uh, burn centers, uh, burn prevention program, and uh, was also and still am adjunct faculty with the School of Nursing and the School of Public Health. So uh, students have always been uh, entangled in my uh, in my career, which I, I love working with students and uh, you know looking at the future of the profession and helping to uh, to mold that. So I still do that in sort of a, a limited fashion. But uh, uh, but yes, I spent 36 and a half years as the uh, director of the outreach and prevention program. And as I like to tell people, I saw my job as putting my colleagues out of work because if no one was getting burned. Right. There was no need for any burn nurses. And right. uh, sometimes when our um, admissions were very, very low, uh, my colleagues would come to me and say, you're doing your job too well. We're not getting <laughs> any admissions. So, so it was either feast or famine, but right. uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful career. And I never, um, even to this very day, I've never regretted choosing nursing as a profession. Um, I uh, can look back every day, even today, and see that I've made a difference somewhere, and uh, that's what, what keeps me going. Right. 
Well, your background's just extremely impressive and your drive, um, really, we call it at Microsoft, a learn it all, rather than a know it all, yeah. we like to be learn it all. Yes. Um, oh, yes. Tell me, so how did you get involved with a and I know that you're the first male president for right. ANA, which is quite an accomplishment. Um, I know, yes. you know, diversity, we're looking for more diversity in nursing. And so what, what really uh, attracted you to be, to serve in this role? Well, um, okay, so I, as you mentioned, I am the first male president of the American Nurses Association. First one, uh, see, when I assumed the presidency, ANA was 122 years old. So to go right. that long right. without having a, a male president is uh, is just unprecedented. And I'm also the third, uh, only the third African American to hold the position wow. of a president. Um, but my journey to ANA started actually um, back in 1985 when I was graduating from my undergraduate program. Uh, a colleague of mine at the time uh, that I was working with, about two weeks before my graduation, she came up to me and she said, um, you know, do you consider yourself a professional nurse? And I said, well, of course, you know, I'm, you know, I'm graduating, I'll have uh, you know, my baccalaureate degree and et cetera. And she says, well, no, you're not really, a, yes, you are a professional nurse, but you're not truly a professional nurse unless you join your professional association. You've got to be a member of your professional association. And she stressed the word active member. And that is something that I have always uh, continued to say whenever I have talked with people about uh, joining their professional organization, um, you know, because you need to have a voice and the say of how your profession is practiced, because if you don't do it, someone else with a degree far removed from nursing is going to be making those decisions for you. So um, so I started out, um, you know, the way ANA works is that you are a member of your state nurses association as well as a member of ANA. And uh, so I, you know, started out at the state level, um, you know, was appointed to a few committees and you know, sometimes people see leadership skills in you that you don't see yourself. And right. uh, that was recognized. And, you know, some people said, oh, you ought to run for this office or that office. And I was like, no, 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 I can't. No, please, you know, you, you'd be great at it. And, you know, had a few little successes and et cetera. And then eventually um, offices at the state level migrated to serving on committees within a and and then, uh, you know, and eventually, uh, you know, serving in various offices uh, within ANA. And, um, and I knew at that time that I wanted to be president of the ANA, but I didn't realize that I'd be the first male pre president. Right. I thought that would have happened long before I, uh, you know, I, I got there. But, uh, uh, you know, as fate would have it, um, you know, it, uh, it turned out that, uh, you know, that I was elected as the first one. And what a time to be uh, president right, <laughs> at, right. at AMA for uh, a number of reasons, not only because of what's going on with COVID-19, but, um, you know, with all the, uh, you know, the milestones that is going on. We're about ready to celebrate our 125th anniversary as an organization. Um, and, of course, you know, this is the year of the nurse and midwife, right. uh, 2020. And then there's also, uh, you know, the Nursing Now campaign that is going on also. So uh, it's really great to be at the, uh, you know, the, the, the helm at this point in time. Yeah, it's it's very interesting how, you know, going into this year, year of the nurse and midwife, I think from my perspective in terms of how we wanted to celebrate um, and things that we had planned, you know, has really taken kind of a 180, if, mm -hmm. you know, if very different than how we planned, but really grateful um, for, for everyone on the front lines, quite frankly, and how, you know, from a technology perspective, we at Microsoft can support them. Um, yes. So really, when you think about this year, and you mentioned COVID nineteen, from your perspective, um, what do you what do you think right now are the biggest challenges for nurses in the U.S. in light of COVID nineteen? Well, there there are several big challenges. It's a really great question. There are several uh, big challenges. Obviously, the the biggest one is um, making the decision to to go to work. You know, because um, when you consider, as we're hearing, even though this is uh, being recorded in you know in late April, 
we're still hearing that you know nurses are um, not getting or not having enough proper uh, PPEs or you know personal protective equipment, um, and they're having to to make the decision: uh, Do I go to work and possibly contaminate my coworkers? You know, contaminate other patients, and worse yet, possibly bring this virus home to my family or you know who may be vulnerable as well because. You know, we have a lot of blended families, if you will, where there may be an older adult or young children living in the home also. And as you pretty well know, a lot of them have um, decided to either uh, stay, you know, isolate themselves or quarantine themselves from their their families, uh, you know, to reduce that that risk. So that's one big problem. The other one is um, I really worry about the uh, the psychological and mental health strain that this is putting on on nurses when you're seeing multiple patients die during your shift, whereas normally we may see that, you know, uh, you know, maybe one or two deaths a month, uh, you know, in particular units or whatever. Sometimes you may have as many as six to 12 deaths, you know, within a 12 hour period. Right. Um, that within itself can be, you know, very, uh, you know, just disturbing because there's no one to really, you know, uh, to perhaps have that outlet to or to go to and, uh, or hopefully, uh, you know, people will realize that they're having these stress or, you know, PTSD symptoms and right. will seek help. Uh, you know, so that's, a, you know, a, a second thing. And, of course, the third thing is, um, you know, one of my biggest fears is that, uh, you know, they may, um, you know, feel like, you know, is this what I really want to do as a nurse? Right. Uh, you know, and the possibility that they may want to, uh, you know, to leave the profession. I think for 99% of them, uh, it is. You know, we are professional. We rise to the challenge. Uh, you know, they just want to be assured that, um, you know, they have the proper equipment to do the work that they need to do. And uh, as we're seeing more and more PPEs come down the, you know, the, the pipeline or the supply chain, um, I think we'll see some of those fears uh, beginning to abate a little bit, um, you know, that uh, since they are getting the proper equipment, now they're able to do the work that is uh, is being asked of them. Uh, but those are three really top things that I see right now that is, uh, you know, is really challenging for the nursing workforce right now. And I, I do want to say that I am uh, extremely proud and happy of the uh, the work that my colleagues are doing on the front line. Mm -hmm. And we at ANA are, you know, advocating on their behalf in so many ways, talking with Congress, talking with the task force, you know, uh, you know, putting out, uh, you know, webinars and things like that, that will also help to educate them as to what they need to know about this virus and, uh, you know, and how to do best practices as, as we learn uh, new things as well. Great. Yeah, I know that actually one of my follow up questions was really surround, you know, around the point you made that second point around the mental health of our mm -hmm. nurses, our clinicians, really anyone who's in the stressful environment, as we know, um, leading into COVID-19, just there was tremendous um, press and recognition of clinician burnout in general. And so I think that having COVID-19 on top of this just really mm -hmm. exacerbates that uh, component. And yeah. I'm just wondering what, if anything, are you with ANA working on around this or thinking about? Um, I know I've seen a lot more recently, you know, around telehealth and mental health. Um, but do you have, you know, thoughts on how we can potentially, you know, work with, with our nurses, not so much today, but as you mentioned, the, the mm -hmm. PTSD that's, you know, coming in, in once the initial um, kind of onslaught is done, but that that post period, like the summer and in September, October, and even, you know, thinking about, um, and this is just another question, so my apologies, but um, <laughs> as we move into this period with new graduates and bringing them on, and it's just, you know, a very um, changing dynamic. So mm -hmm. any thoughts around Around yeah. some of those points. Let me, uh, I, I guess, first answer the the first part of the question is is that yes, ANA uh, is uh, you know putting some things in place uh, that will uh, help 
uh, with the, uh, the psychological and, and mental health of the uh, you know, healthcare providers. Uh, you may be aware that we have started a COVID recovery fund for nurses, right. and part of the funds uh, that is raised is specifically uh, earmarked to, um, you know, to help uh, with the, uh, you know, the psych and, and mental health needs uh, that uh, that they may have. And and let me back up for just a second because, you know, having been in multiple disasters myself, uh, right. you know, uh, with the. Um, uh, you know, the 9-11 uh, incident, uh, the few incidents that we've had in uh, North Carolina that, uh, you know, involved either, uh, you know, explosions or the Pope Air Base disaster or even, you know, those that have been weather related or whatever. You know, the difference between those and this crisis that we're in now is that you had the incident happen you, you know, you rallied your forces and you could see the end, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. You knew that probably within, you know, uh, you know, six weeks to three months or so, things were sort of beginning to turn back to, uh, to normal. Uh, with this crisis right now, um, you know, we don't quite see <laughs> the end of the tunnel, you know, so it's going to be this continued uh, uh, stress as we learn more and more about this um you know, this virus every day, um, you know, we can anticipate that, yes, it's a possibility it may uh, begin to um, uh, slack off a little bit during the, the summer, uh, you know, with the uh, the heat and such. But, uh, you know, but still, there still is going to be those people who are still sick, uh, who maybe not needing intensive care, but, uh, you know, still warrant care in, in the, the hospital. So the question is, uh, is it possible that people will get the, um, uh, you know, the the downtime, if you will, right, the, the psychological right. health downtime in order to uh, ensure that um, they are, you know, able to, to have that? The, the other thing is, of course, getting people to recognize that um, there is that psych mental health need that they, uh, you know, that they have. Uh, sometimes we're, you know, we're, we're too proud to admit that or, mm -hmm. Uh, you don't, you know, by admitting that you're admitting that perhaps you may be weak or, or whatever, and that's not the case at all. We want them to be able to do, you know, to be at their, their level best. So they need to seek out that uh, that information or the resources that are there uh, so that uh, they can recover and, you know, be able to go back to work and do a, uh, you know, resume their their duties as opposed to, letting that continue to pile up. And as it does, we know that that's not going to be good because, uh, you know, we know mistakes are made. Um, you know, they could turn to, you know, maybe alcohol or something like right. that as a way to relieve that. Uh, and and that's not the answer. That's not what right. we, we want to have happen. So uh, that's why it's important that we have these programs and things in place. Right. Yeah. And um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit to think about, um, talk a little bit about, uh, just, you know, I've read so much in the press. I actually just read an article that came out yesterday in the Washington Post talking about um, the role of, of nurses in this pandemic and the transformation within the healthcare system. Um, and I personally, you know, I've been with Microsoft for seven years and I was telling someone I ha I've seen more transformation from a, into a digital world happen mm -hmm. in the past seven weeks than I have in the past um, seven years. Um, and maybe it's longer than seven weeks now. But <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering from from your perspective and, and how your lens with with the pandemic with nurses um, and with technology, how do you see our roles evolving, um, you know, beyond like the traditional um, bedside nurse or just even with, um, you know, bringing technology in? So, for example, I know we've been working with different nurses around um, just virtual rounding with families, for example, um, to potentially say even save PPE, you know, giving the, the patient communication tools in their room um, just to, to reduce that exposure and contact, not that we want the patient isolated by any means, um, yeah. but even just to have that contact with family through technology. And it's exciting for me, I, you know, I've been in technology for so long, but just to see this 
change take place for people to become more comfortable, I guess, with the yes. technology. And so I'm just curious to, to hear from you. Um, you know, I know it's, you know, you worked in, in Burns, um, so technology might not necessarily be where you spent a lot of your time, but I would love to hear your, yeah. your opinion. <laughs> Uh, actually, technology was uh, right up there and still is. Um, and uh, I guess perhaps the, the if there is one quote unquote good thing that could come right. out of this, uh, this crisis is the fact that uh, we know um, uh, when you think of technology and particularly telehealth, telemedicine and et cetera, uh, I think um, this crisis has elevated that or has sped that up. Um, right. You know, so and um, and so for the role of the nurse, particularly the advanced practice nurse, um, you know, as a lot of states have relaxed the um, restrictions uh, that were in place on their practice so that they um, have a broader um, scope of practice and be able to, you know, the practice to the full extent of their their education. You know, this is this is wonderful because now they are able to, you know, to combine, you know, that those relaxed rules. Uh, right. technology and et cetera, to provide better care, uh, have greater access to individuals perhaps than, uh, you know, than, than what they could perhaps under the, the you know, the old way, if you will, right. uh, whereby patients coming to them were actually coming to the patient. So you're mm -hmm. actually able to see more people, uh, you know, as that, uh, you know, comes about. Now, the downside to that is, of course, areas uh, where there's a uh, disparate care or, you know, technology is not quite there, you know, right. uh, you may not have the broadband, uh, you know, in certain areas to, uh, you know, to, to really, um, you know, uh, do that. But I think um, as we realize that, you know, this is going to provide more greater opportunities, I, I think those um, uh, stumbling blocks, if you will, are going to be, um, you know, out of, uh, you know, gotten rid of soon, and where there is lack of broadband and et cetera, it will be there uh, right. you know, to to provide that. So I think uh, overall, what we're going to see is just a large amount of uh, uh, you know um, you know interdependence, if you will, on telehealth, telemedicine, technology, uh, in order to provide uh, you know greater care, and um, it's a it's a whole new wave. So in actuality, I think we probably are going to be seeing more specialization, if you will, in uh, you know in those particular areas, uh, mm -hmm. not only on from the nursing perspective, but also uh, you know on the physician perspective right. as well. You know, yeah. and uh, so and it's just going to be a, a matter of uh, you know maybe two or three years as opposed to as it was slowly creeping along before the crisis happened. Uh, what may have right. taken you know, where we are right now was probably going to take another 10 years, you know, to, right. to get there. So, uh, you know, so we're there. And also, I, I guess um, I'll just serve notice as well is that we are, you know, um, part of a, a task force that is looking at, you know, keeping those um, uh, those relaxed rules in place. You right. know, if the right. advanced practice nurse can practice in emergency situations, uh, right. You know, why is it good during normal, uh, you know, normal times? Uh, so, um, you know, we've made some great strides and want to keep moving forward. And I think for the whole profession of nursing period, it is, um, this is our time. We, right. You know, it's, it's ironic. This is the year of the nurse. Uh, and it, it wasn't, as you mentioned at the beginning, it wasn't what we really thought it was going to be. But I, I think given the, you um, uh, the attention that we have now from the public and that they are on our side and they recognize and see what uh, what we as nurses do, um, you know, that uh, we've got to capitalize on that and and, and really move forward and, um, you know, and not look back, you know, and not go back to, to, to where we were before. Uh, we really do have to uh, seize this opportunity. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity and, you know, right. No, I'm with you. Um, I, you know, it is, it, it's our time. And to your point around the relaxed regulations, just 
having the ability to work to the top of our license, whether that's an advanced practice nurse license, whether it's registered nurse license, et cetera. I think that was one of the original goals even of the who's um, year of the nurse and midwife. So we can push that as well as really increase our investment in nursing uh, as a profession, in education, et cetera. Um, I do want to just wrap up with one final question as we think about the time of the year. It's April 29th and mm -hmm. what would have been graduation for so many um, seniors in college, high school, et cetera. Um, I'm just going to maybe put you on the spot and ask you what advice if you were to give a new graduate, um, what advice would you give to someone right now entering the nursing profession? For someone entering the nursing profession right now, or even graduating, you know, the, the new graduates, right. I would say, wow, what a time to be um, either entering nursing or, you know, starting your, your nursing career. Uh, they are on the forefront of a huge uh, wave of change. And, uh, you know, I sometimes doing some of the, the talks that I give, I always, uh, you know, use the, uh, the term that uh, I want people to be a change agent. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the time to uh, you know to do that. Um, it's um, <clears throat> there's a whole new world that's opening up, uh, that's embracing technology, that's embracing you know innovations, um, and also in embracing the um, <clears throat> you know the profession itself. You know, right. uh, lifting up our standards and you know and, and who we are. And so to go back to what I, I said before, this is our time. You know what better time to be uh, coming into a, a profession, especially uh, with young, fresh ideas, which you know we really need to uh, you know to embrace, to bring us into the 21st and even indeed the 22nd century. Right. You know. Uh, you know this is this is truly awesome. I think if Florence Nightingale was to look back, uh, you know, or was to come to us now and and look at what she had started, um, you know, a little over, you know, well, 200 years ago. Uh, I think she would be truly impressed that um, you know that the profession has uh, has arced up as uh, as much as it has, uh, but we still have a ways to go. Um, you know, and so for someone considering nursing as a career or that is starting their nursing career, you could symbolically say we're passing the torch to you. It's your time now, and mm -hmm. it's your time to to make that difference. And um, I, I think. Um, I think we're they are are ready to to do that to take on that challenge. Well, great. Appreciate um, your comments, and just want to say um, thank you so much on behalf of Microsoft and all thank of you. my colleagues within the the healthcare industry, and appreciate everything that you're doing for all of the nurses on the front lines. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for watching. Please feel free to leave us questions or comments below and check back soon for more content from the HLS industry team.